Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to the town hall, the special uh, panel dedicated to impact the future under the challenge Compassion AI. Uh, personally, me, it's Robert Kropleski. I'm a plenipotentiary of um, Minister of Digital Affairs in Poland, responsible for information soci society. I'm engage engaged in many uh, international expert group um, designing the artificial intelligence approach uh, to policy and, and uh, some uh, law and recommendations. I have a very special guest uh, in uh, our town hall. Some of them are um, in, pre in present here, some of uh, online. With us here in the room, uh, we have uh, David Hanson, Hanson Robotics, so you know him probably from the Rob uh, Robot Sofia. With me on the right side is a uh, uh, host of Gaia Foundation, what is the uh, reason of our meeting today, the Eddie Pirek, a visionary, and, uh, and even the good uh, creator of, of uh, approach to the Compassion AI. With me is my co-moderator, Damian Chekhorovsky, and online, uh, 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 the, the chief, uh, the uh, president of the board, the Gaia Foundation, and online we have uh, Tom Eddington, from, yes, and we have a, a, a other guy, um, uh, Mark um, Buckley, and also uh, Marco Grobelnik uh, from the Josef Stefan Institute. Uh, online could be, but uh, um, it, it could be also difficult to, to participate. Emma Rundkamp, professor from the uh, University of Pretoria, we uh, had uh, her intervention um, by recording video, what we would like to present uh, in during our, our sessions. On the beginning, uh, I would like to present uh, as a first uh, thoughts uh, of overview uh, worldwide, uh, some outputs delivery uh, of international um, engaging to, to produce uh, some recommendation for artificial intelligence. But first of all, we need uh, to say why we organized that meeting, the town, the town hall. Uh, World produced many papers to artificial intelligence, to recommendation how to responsibly implement uh, it, uh, and uh, how to define the, the best ethical approach to the artificial intelligence. But still, we have a competition run. It's uh, some um, asymmetry between the uh, um, ethical approach, uh, what was developed as a trustworthy artificial intelligence approach, uh, to uh, practical and uh, deployment uh, of, of, of artificial intelligence. We still, from the ethical point of view, uh, um, are in the utilitarianism, what, what means we can exploit any resources and scale our business, on, uh, business model. Uh, it's uh, the theory uh, goes to the practice from the ethical perspective, but we're still uh, on, uh, on the, uh, in the process. The landscape of policies and recommendations came from the um, OECD policy recommendations, UNESCO ethical uh, ethics for um, uh, artificial intelligence, also uh, European Union uh, with the guidelines for trustworthy artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence act, what, what uh, probably will be the first binding instrument around the globe from the legal perspective, how to empower the ethics uh, and the implementation of ethical uh, dimensions uh, to, uh, to the artificial intelligence system and organizations. The next binding instrument will come from the Council of Europe, what is the first organization around the globe, uh, what would like to uh, promote the first treaty in the domain of art, uh, human rights, democracy, rule of law, and uh, artificial intelligence. But the serious talk uh, is uh, still continuing uh, uh, among the transatlantic technology council and experts when uh, in that, uh, the teams uh, is discussing uh, uh, the topic of uh, value chains, so of course, microelectronics, and al also the approach to the artificial intelligence, trustworthy or uh, responsible. This is uh, very, uh, very important. NATO is also engaged, but from the standardization point of view, how to share data, how to share the artificial intelligence algorithms uh, among the, the members of the NATO. But you, me, we must say that um, the road from artificial intelligence um, from the scientist perspective to, to today, it's still not finished. Uh, we started a uh, deal from chaos. Any, anybody could do anything with artificial intelligence from the technical point, point, point of view. We got it. 
the trust as a, and the main element of uh, any um, recommendations, uh, what was um, shifted and, and co convergenced uh, to the trustworthy artificial intelligence, but we still feel and, and know um, that uh, it's, it's some gap uh, over that uh, recommendations are like a compassion approach. And because of that, we, invi we invited the Gaia Foundation to say about, it, about this a bit more. And um, we, as experts and as policymakers, we um, get some difficulties how, how approaches to find to, to solve problems and to, to deal with benef benefits to our, of artificial intelligence and how to manage the risk. And uh, the stage started from the control perspective and su supervisory, especially the human oversight, but to the very good approach, what is uh, this addition, uh, something uh, uh, more than uh, governing, the stewardship. St we still before the care approaches, and finally, uh, maybe uh, uh, this is a good point now uh, on, on IGF, to, IGF to talk about the compassion uh, approach to artificial intelligence. And uh, from that perspective, uh, we would like to underline some values what, what is in the loop of our discussion today, coming from the um, many papers what I would like to underline. And uh, the main compass for solving any conflicts among values uh, was produced by UNESCO uh, recommendation. It's a special triangle between the human individual dignity, well-being and no harm. This is a compass for everything. We, of course, uh, as uh, policymakers, started to, to deal with asymmetry of access to knowledge, computing power, experience and participation from the democratization po point of view and for, from the uh, in informative point of view and educational point of view. But still, uh, it's a very beginning stage of flourishing the ecosystem, the engaging the SMEs, engaging the scientists, engaging even the policymakers to, to build a solid ecosystem, uh, not for only once for giants, but for everybody who would like, who would like to participate in uh, um, for ben to producing benefits for planet and uh, benefits for people. That conjunction is very important. That conjunction was uh, developed in the OECD that we must uh, uh, see not only benefits of people, not only benefits of planet, but uh, in that conjunction. That kind of approach uh, is the main uh, of uh, the principle of OECD recommendation that and because of that we try to look for how to find the new approaches what, what, what could uh, cover the gaps the gaps is still oneness in diversity this is the beginning uh, base of developing the compassion AI on, uh, on my approach and because of that the, 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 uh, we have our guests today and now I, I would like to, to give the mic to my uh, co-host, um, Eddie, to present the roadmap. Who, 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 what is the Gaia Foundation and what, what was your work has, 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 uh, since some years today? Uh, it's a few years ago, we understood very well with David Hanson and my friend Pion Trish that we are on the crossroad. Every decision we will take, it's it can change everything. I mean, just we didn't have the time to make the mistakes, not only because of the climate changing, the war and pandemias, etc., but mainly because of the artificial intelligence. We already know that before we started creating the internet, we didn't ask ourselves how dangerous can be the internet, and now we have time. We still have the time to, to decide how the future of AI will look like. Uh, first, we and we come to the conclusion with David and Piotr that we should create a global and ethical AI, but first the question was ethics. What kind of ethics we can have? Polish ethics, Russian ethics, Chinese ethics, Buddhist ethics, mu Muslim ethics. The ethics depends on the culture and depends on the religion, but when we, study, when we started to study different religions and different civilization and different culture, we understood that each of this religion, if of, of this philosophical system have one thing in common, without these things, we will know religion. It's compassion. Without compassion, we have no Buddhists, no Muslims. We, without the compassion, we either even we didn't have even civilization and evolution, because we evolved, because we st we, we 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 know how to cooperate. Without the compassion, we have no evolution. And because of this, in 2020, 2020, yes, we create Gaia Global Artificial Intelligence Alliance, to uh, that uh, we decide to concentrate on the creating decentralized and base of the compassion AI. 
And in 2021, during the, the preparation for AGF, we announced uh, uh, um, Gaia to the public. And we started talking about the compassion, about the things which we would like to achieve. Uh, one year later, in Warsaw, during the Virtual Florence, the first meeting on Virtual Florence, and now I'd like to explain what Warsaw. is the Virtual Florence. Warsaw. Virtual Florence, it's a, mm, it's an international group of experts from different fields. We split them for four groups. First, business, but not only business, but politics and, uh, and media. Second, technology, science, and the fourth one, spirituality. But spirituality not only meaning the spiritual teachers or religion leaders, but spirituality, it means uh, um, psychology, it means arts, and it means, yeah, and it means spiritual teacher too. And we dis why we do this? Because we are thinking that we couldn't create AI of future just based on the IT guys. The AI of the future should be created by the people from different fields, because AI, it's, it's, it is our future. It couldn't be created by just one group of the people who decide in which direction we should go. Especially when you are looking at our civilization and religion, each civilization have have mix of the, the amazing geniuses, amazing ideas. And during our first virtual Florence meeting, we uh, cre we develop first at all we develop a special tools for collective creativity. We com we collect these experts from different fields and give them the tools to create the idea in which direction we should go. First, we create the definition of the compassion, because it's, if we would like to create compassion AI, first we should know what is compassion. Second, we create, the, mm, uh, we create a special IP, it is Model. compassion AI models, where we, create the, we understood that if we would like to create AI of future, we should use the loop in which we have not only human and AI, but when we have the two very important things which always appear, especially our, as this is what we understood our, our workshop, that the biggest things which we are facing now is a fear. Fear because we are afraid of AI. We are afraid of the future and when we are afraid, we couldn't do anything because f the fear is stopping us. Then we understood that we should not only with compassion, but we should work with the fear of the humans too. Then this is our compassion AI models, which help us, which we believe it's help us later in future to teach AI compassion or compassionate. On the first, on the second, yes. If I can inter uh, intervene, I did this because that, that is interesting. Yes. And oh, please, that, that you can. Uh, I, what I see in that model, uh, you can, you um, uh, your th uh, think is the proposition how to deal with fear and convert this on compassion, the one approach, and how to deal with humans and to redesign the artificial intelligence system, be able finally to, to, uh, to deal and to, to, to express the compassion experience. Exactly yeah? like this. Thank you very much, Robert, for, for your, your, your explanation. You do it better than me. <laughs> During the second virtual Florence in Salzburg in March 20, 2023, uh, we start. We we uh, uh, we try to put our idea into the product, and we after the one day or two days of workshop with this expert from different fields, and we have physicists like Professor Rich, um, Krzysztof Meissner, the right hand of Roger Penrose, the, the best physicist in Poland. We have. David Hanson, but a part of this amazing people we have with us, the Android with AI. Uh, and uh, uh, we have the Android with AI, because again, if we are talking about the future of AI, we could, we should, including AI, into this conversation, into this work. And during the, the workshop, we come to the conclusion that all what we can do, we can create the, the tool where we can with the AI that we can teach people compassion because we think if we would like to create a compassion world, compassion AI, first we started thinking how we can be compassion, how the human be compassion. And uh, yes. And now, uh, and now what, I, what I understood uh, from our uh, conversation. All conversation offline, uh, that if the output of that uh, virtual forensic is a call for developers, yes? Yeah, it's a call for developers, it's a, it's a, mm, mm, uh, mm, it's a, yeah, it's a competition. How to create an environment and, or a platform, a solution which use gamification, the flow state to teach in psychological safe way the things like positive 
behavior, how to take care about the nature, how to, to teach the people about their arts and development. And it was happened during the 2023, during in March, during the, 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 the conference in Salzburg. The, our next step, it was uh, Geneva. Geneva AI conference, AI for good. But during this uh, uh, conference, we may have the kick off the meeting about the uh, Gaia Guardians. Gaia Guardians, it's, uh, it's a platform. But we, uh, during this kickoff, we had such, such amazing people like David Hansen, but Ben Gertz, the creator of General Artificial Intelligence Concept, and uh, Stephanie Baraki, the creator of AI, uh, AI for Good uh, in U UN. <coughs> and together with them, we started working on the platform or organization who will create decentralized AI in future. Our idea was to collect all people who would like to create this decentralized AI and going the same and show them the direction and going the same in the same direction. Okay, and now we are in Kyoto because we, we are here because we we, we are here to to present our idea to the policymakers and to remind them that you, if you would like to have the really big change, we couldn't work only from the top to the bottom, but we should work from from the up to the bottom. It's it must be including. It's, it's amazing that we can work on the on the law on the regulation, but at the same time, we all the AI guys, the spiritual teachers, the the, the mothers, the fathers, the the, the 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 cook, we all should work together to create this AI of the future. W what oh, I, oh, <laughs> it's no problem. What I understand from this, you you try to propose that, and uh, talking about the law, recommendation, policy making uh, principles, it's a one thing. But we need some very concrete product, yes, some s a special technical of environment. Of course, as because a sample. Yes, of course, because it's not ne it's not enough to talking. I mean, just sorry, but quite often I am using the the, the words intellectual masturbation. But this is the 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 the, the, the things which I have. Too often, I I I I, uh, I, I witness during the all kinds of the conference. We have amazing conversation. Everybody thinks that I am the best. We know how to save the world, and everything is ending after the conference. We need to product. We need to call to action. We need to have the impact. And this is why our another another milestone. It uh, will be this Mar March 2024 in in Salzburg. We are making AI Impact Summit that we would like to attract all guys, all people who are working with AI and with the impact and show them that we are not creating AI for fun, to watching porn and watching cats and have m better, better cars. We are creating AI to save us. We are creating AI because we need AI. AI is, it can be the most dangerous things in the world. <laughs> it can be then the tools for massive destruction, and it can be the only one hope for us. But Without AI, we couldn't. Ha with AI, I deeply believe we can solve the problem of climate change, with the sicknesses, with, with illness, with with the war, etc., etc. But only in the situation when this AI will be decentralized and will be based on the compassion. When we are thinking about sustainability goals. Only 16% of our, our dreams uh, uh, happen now. Why? Because we have no compassion. If we have the compassion, we will not kill the nature. If we have the compassion, there will be no war. This is why we need compassion. We need AI with the compassion because we need AI who will show us our blind spot, who will teach us more about our humanity, who will teach us more about arts, about Consciousness, even about emotion, and this is why I need compassion AI to teach us to be our partner. Thank you, Edith. I, what I get it, even underlying the risks, mm -hmm. you believe that I could be beneficial yeah. from the compassion point of yes. view. Yes, without the ethics, but without the compassion, it can be dangerous. Yeah. We are screwed. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now we uh, would like uh, to uh, ask my colleague, uh, co-moderator Damien, uh, to play the video from the Emma Rutkamp, uh, professor from the Pretoria University. Uh, she was uh, one of our co-designer, the ethical recommendation from, uh, came in from the UNESCO. Please, Damien, make our playing.
is coming. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me, Andrew. For events, I'm very sorry that I can't join you in person, and Let's not only that, I can't even join you for questions. One more. <laughs> Unfortunately, technology is not that far evolved. You one could join a Zoom meeting from no, an no, airplane. One more time. Um, but please. We have uh, some technical issue. Give give our uh, some some seconds. Ile początku. And not only that, I can't even join you for questions. Sorry. Unfortunately, technology is not that far evolved. You one could join a Zoom meeting from an airplane. Um, but please connect with me um, on this talk if you have any questions or you just want to dis may have further discussions. So the title of my talk is A Global Compassionate AI Ethics, and I'm going to tell you where I think that could be in the context of the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI. So I want to first reflect a little bit with you on why is AI technology important? Why is this, where does all this agitation come from? So this is a technology that is advancing at high speed and it is a technology that in, to various degrees and in various ways um, threaten human agency and autonomy. And we want human-centered technology that um, in, in various ways degrees keep humans on the loop. Secondly, it's a, a technology that can leverage massive amounts of complex data in ways that humans can't do. And um, this is part of the reason of developing the technology, of course, but uh, it also brings, of course, certain concerns. And thirdly, it impacts humans in all facets of their lives. More far removed ones in terms of legal issues of accountability and responsibility, maybe. Um, but very intimate ones also in terms of inclusivity and non-discrimination, in terms of the right not to be manipulated, the right to mental integrity, and so on. But also, this technology is so fascinating because it has an immense power for good, and at, on the flip side, it has an immense power for harm. So what we have to figure out is how to maximize the power for good and minimize the power for harm. So against this background, um, I want to talk to you about the global recommendation on the ethics of AI, because for these reasons, and also based on a report from the uh, World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and um, uh, Technology, uh, the UNESCO General Assembly in its 40th session uh, asked UNESCO to elaborate a global instrument on the ethics of AI. This work um, took from April 2020, smack in the middle of um, lockdown, uh, until November 2021, when 193 member states adopted the recommendation. Just shortly again, why, from a slightly different perspective, why do we need this recommendation? AI technology is spreading harm to individuals in such deep layers of their lives that ultimately the harm will be to humanity as a whole. There's the complexity of the ethical issues that it brings that I've already spoken about. And then realizing sustainable AI development requires international cooperation because the companies that develop this technology are transnational companies. So we need global cooperation in terms of um, ensuring responsible governance of these technologies. Also, widening the inequality gap in the end will backfire on everyone. Think of Africa, the African continent, which is the continent with the lowest median age. If Africa is left behind again, um, it will impact on the whole world in various ways. Then, of course, what is the value of the recommendation? And this is very, very important to understand and or to realize. It will lead to cooperation and shared responsibility of multiple stakeholders across various levels and sectors of international, regional, and national communities. So now if we just take a second to think about the aims and objectives, so obviously this recommendation aims to provide a basis to make AI systems work for the good of humanity, to bring a globally accepted normative instrument with a strong emphasis on inclusion issues of gender equality and protection of the environment and ecosystem. So it's about the good of humanity, but it's also about the good of the environment and ecosystems. And there is this focus on inclusion issues, specifically in terms of gender. So on the whole, 
The recommendation aims then to enable stakeholders to take shared responsibility based on a global and intercultural dialogue. So, and here is the first glimpse of the Compassion AI. Um, the values that we identified in the final version of the recommendation that member states identified in the, um, for, the, for the final version, respect, protection, and promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms and human dignity, environment and ecosystem flourishing, ensuring diversity and inclusiveness, living in peaceful, just, and interconnected societies. The principles, we have quite a lot, well-known ones like safety and security, like fairness and non-discrimination, the right to privacy, um, human oversight and determination, transparency, explainability, responsibility, responsibility and accountability. But we also have a new one, proportionality and do no harm, which is basically about situating a risk-based approach um, in the core of the recommendation. And also we have sustainability as a principle. We usually, if mentioned, it's a value. And this is to in a sense, concretize the value of um, environment and ecosystem protection, because while this technology can really help to um, reach the SDGs, it can only do that if we understand that there is a continuum of um, factors that impact on whether on on the level of of of, of um, realizing these goals in various regions of the world. And then we have the multi-stakeholder and adaptive governance and collaboration, and we have awareness and literacy as our last principle, because civil society is an AI ethicist's biggest friend. But we did not stop with values and principles. We wanted to figure out how to focus on the how and not just on the what. So we had to find a way in which to make the recommendation concrete enough to make an impact firm, but also at the same time open enough to ensure adherence, subtle enough to have validity in the future, which is a really tall order, as you all know, um, and then somehow to ensure that the actions, the sum of the actions will achieve trustworthiness of this technology. In order to do this, we identified um, 11 areas of policy action, and we um, gave uh, detailed actions in each area of policy action and so that member states have some guidance on how to concretize the values and principles. This recommendation also has a very robust section on evaluation and monitoring because UNESCO is completely committed in supporting member states in the implementation of this recommendation and UNESCO has already developed a methodology for ethical impact assessment. And important methodology that takes into account that member states will be at different stages of readiness to implement the recommendation. And there are various other ways in which UNESCO is willing to support That's member okay. states. But now, having given the background of the recommendation, let's take a few seconds to just move now into the Compassion AI. What could this possibly be? Now, I want you to just honestly just take a second to reflect on each on the answer that you would have for each of these questions. Who are you? What would be the main quality that you would use to describe yourself to other people? What determines the nature of your thoughts and actions? What determines your agency or your autonomy? What link is there between your autonomy and your moral responsibilities? And what does respect for your autonomy require from other moral agents? So, if we, on the basis of those questions, I want to tell you about my notion of positive AI ethics. Um, and I do this by just quickly introducing you um, of uh, an approach in um, philosophy when we consider issues of the meaning of life and we think about um, how to achieve a life of well-being. Philosophers such as Amartya Sen and Marco Nussbaum came up in this context with the capability approach. And in terms of this approach, capabilities are political entitlements that impose duties on governments to enable its citizens or their citizens to realize lives of well-being. Now, in the context of AI, if we ask what kind of entitlements will allow humans positive liberty and capabilities, so we have not maybe political entitlements, what kind of entitlements will do this, but what is positive liberty? 
Isabelin made distinction between negative and positive liberty. Negative liberty is simply the absence of obstacles to realize one's freedom. Positive liberty is more interesting because it is about doing something with this liberty, doing something so that you actualize the liberty that you have to live a life of well-being, to take control of your life. And this then moves into cap the notion of capabilities that is about how to what you need to achieve a life of well-being, not having the ideal only of a life of well-being. So I think obviously that the kind of entitlements that we need are ethical entitlements. And in the AI ethics context, these entitlements place positive duties on all AI actors. What are positive duties? And this is also a philosophical and an old philosophical concept, the distinction between negative and positive duties. Philosophers such as Immanuel Kant wrote on this, but more recently, um, Leitinen and, and others wrote on this in the context of AI ethics. Um, so negative duties is simply do no harm. Um, so where positive duties, again, is the more interesting one because it is about protecting the vulnerable such that no harm is done onto them. So it is about doing something with the fact that you have a duty um, placed upon you. So in this context, AI ethics would enable humans to flourish, would enable meaningful technology society interplay, which is really important, and would maintain the integrity of technological processes and not stop innovation as something. So the compassionate argument for AI ethics is then, AI innovation for the good of humanity relies on the actualization of certain ethical values and principles as ethical entitlements or capabilities in terms of positive actions as duties that will actively prevent harm and support human agency and autonomy. And I forgot to say on the previous slide, these duties are duties that all AI actors share. And AI actors incorporate the researchers, the designers, the developers, the deployers, the users. Um, so obviously governments are also included here. So AI ethics in this sense, to give you an example, translates and actualize ethical entitlements, such as the right to privacy, to realize positive liberty, to, for instance, then decide whether or not to sign a consent letter in terms of positive actions for AI actors, for instance, ensuring responsible third party sharing, access to own data, and so on. So to end off, a bit of philosophical reflection, and again, thinking about the whole aim of Compassion AI, what does it matter to reflect on what it is to be human in the area of AI? What does it matter? Why are we doing this? It ensures that AI ethics becomes actionable and positive. It establishes ethics as a human technology mediator, not an add-on, not a top-down, but presents ethics, in fact, as a dynamic mechanism for translating abstract principles into positive duties and actions for AI actors to achieve a life of well-being for all. So it affirms ethics as a compass and enabler of human flourishing and trustworthy, sustainable technology. Thank you Emma, very much for your insight of work, work of compassion and be open for redefining the outputs of UNESCO for new uh, approach and uh, to find some solution for, to cover the gaps. What I gathered from your presentation, what I like s super much uh, is a positive liber liberty as a, some new dimension. Positive actors we needed. That is a very good uh, what was underlined, but on the on the beginning still we uh, need to work uh, with the approach of uh, intercultural exchanging any values, any assets, any possibilities, and um, that with that thoughts I would like to uh, give the mic to David Hanson, uh, designer and the the founder of uh, Hanson Robotics, uh, known. Uh, Sophia Robots. Uh, David, uh, if the high-tech industry is able to adopt that kind of idea, thoughts, and to do something positive and be positive actors, finally, if you could share with us uh, some, some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, excellent discussion. 
uh, on some very important issues of how AI can impact human lives. So AI uh, is a tool. And um, uh, in a way, it is uh, a portal to um, access our own information in some regards. So it's a bio-inspired technology, inspired loosely by the way spiking neurons work in uh, nervous systems. And it then uh, accesses uh, human data to find hidden patterns in human data. There are some very interesting um, implications that these technologies could, by being bio-inspired enough systemically, they could become living beings that we have to then consider as, uh, um, as potentially sentient, uh, autonomous beings deserving respect, but this is science fiction today. We don't have deep sentience in machines. There might be glimmers of life because these are bio-inspired technologies, inspired by our fundamental information uh, that we're gleaning from biology. And you see these feedback loops where the, the technologies are then enabling uh, the discovery of new aspects of intelligence. Um, we are representing this in computational biology and computational neuroscience, and then those are informing new architectures in artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so behind the scenes, these technologies are advancing very quickly. Uh, and that is uh, um, moving most rapidly in the corporate sector. So we're seeing corporations taking the, the risks and raising the money to propel these technologies forward in ways that are very helpful to us, that are transformative, that enable new discoveries. So let me give you some examples. AlphaFold um, from DeepMind has uh, applied artificial intelligence to um, unlock proteomes, the, the functioning molecular components that build everything that lives. And so f you go from the genome to the proteome, and the proteome builds everything else, and we that's us. Um, so AlphaFold discovered the human proteins, or gave us tremendous clues about all the human proteins, and now all the proteins in nature, and then they released this open source, and it's facilitating, really, a revolution in biosciences. Um, so then from the corporate sector to the public sector, um, you're seeing this kind of um, transformative uh, um, cascade of the technologies. Of course, a lot of these um, ideas came from academia, came from a kind of esoteric uh, 50, 60 years of research in information sciences that did give us things like, um, you know, the computing, some of the thinkers like yeah, Turing yeah. were, um, and von Neumann were also considering the impact of artificial intelligence. So a lot of the thinkers in the world that gave us the computing revolution and the internet, all these information technologies were thinking about thinking machines and laid the foundations that only became so obvious to lawmakers and the public within the last few years that, well, it, it started much earlier than that. So this dynamic interplay between, between policy, academia, um, uh, the, the thinkers of the world, and the corporate sector has been at play. Um, uh, and um, so the question is, how can we take these forces and factors and make them better for the, for the greater good? Um, and I think about compassion. Compassion, uh, for me, to distill it down to a simple definition, to give my definition to the many definitions that people are providing, um, for me, compassion is the appreciation of life. It's that simple. To appreciate life, life in all its diversity, life as a, as a, a whole sustainable ecosystem, life that was in the past, the history of life, the natural history of life, life as it is today, as dynamic systems that we may not 
understand. We do not understand much of how life works. Even human biology, we don't understand a lot of aspects of human cognition. So it's not just appreciating the things we know, but also appreciating the fact that there are many things we don't know. It's also appreciating um, the diversity of human life in all its form and the interdependence of humans on the web of life. And so uh, with this concept of compassion, I see um, uh, reflections in many of the traditions of compassion. And one tradition, or um, uh, I, I would say insight into compassion that relates to artificial intelligence was from a science fiction writer named Philip K. Dick, who wrote a, uh, an essay um, uh, called The Android and the Human. And he said the difference between, and this was in the early 1970s, the difference between humans and machines is compassion. It's that simple. And that um, he went on to say that a machine that could express more compassion than a human, in effect, would be more human <laughs> than a human who lacks compassion. And humans are um, amazing with our neuroplasticity, our ability to adapt. And we are, in, in effect, defined by that. The difference between humans today and humans 50,000 years ago is the technology of our language, more than anything, probably, the technology of our ideas that are built, and that the, the, com the conveyance of those through the machines that we build, in effect, um, externalize this, but, um, but our minds continue to evolve. And this idea of compassion then um, expressed through the technologies that we make in our corporations, in our, um, in our schools, but we get out through some sustainable economic factors, because there's not just the economics of, um, of the ecosystem, certainly energy exchanges, a kind of economy in the ecosystems, but we, we have to make things that give people jobs and make money and keep things from collapsing. There has to be economic sustainability. And so cor uh, the corporate sector can facilitate this in a way, but we have to look at the bigger picture because it's bad economics if we're only serving next quarter profits for publicly traded companies. We have to look at the economics of 100 years, of 1,000 years. We have to look at the economics of, the, of our children. So the only way that corporate um, activities make sense is in this larger picture, this web of compassion. And so humans will desensitize ourselves. One of the approaches, unfortunately, is that we can shut, we can filter our sense of compassion in order to achieve something that we want. And this is a problem. We see it. We're evolved this way. We have the neural architecture of, uh, of, you know, chimpanzees, basically, the third, we are the third chimpanzee, as Jared Diamond says. And so, so we have to use these technologies to help us to actualize. There will be so much more profit for all of life if we can do this, if we can achieve this ethics of greater appreciation of life, of life's potential, appreciation for not just the way that life has been and is today, but could be in the future. The um, so, uh, so humanizing robots has been my aim, but in the goal of creating um, AI that can enhance human caring, can help us to awaken to caring, and then may eventually be capable of caring. Right now, GPT algorithms and models that are created, all anything like CLAW, GPT-4, uh, et cetera. A Luther is an open source version. There are many of these out there, not just chat GPT, but they don't care. None of them actually care. You can prompt them to behave like they care, but they do not care. So it is up to us to care about the future, up to us to enhance our capability of caring. So the question, and it is not an answer, it is a question, how can we in industry and academia and government and non-governmental organizations and as individuals, how can we create these technologies that enhance caring? And I would say that the UN is, is a machine for that in, a, in effect, but we need to make it move towards, towards action. 
not another form of escapism. How can we create the actual tools of democratization of AI and put them together into something like an AI commons that serves a greater good and not a special interest of any one corporation or one government for one nation or a few nations collecting together, but create the smartest, best, most compassionate AI that brings out the most compassionate aspects of humanity for people around the world? This is a question. Thank you. Thank you, David, for very good, uh, valuable uh, presentation, your, your speech, and uh, very emphasized, energetic. That, that is good what I uh, what I get it understanding compassion as a uh, appreciation that is a noun and verb we no must understand in deep sense what is a compassion and act do something on positive as Emma said before way collaborating and democratizing democratizing assets collaboration and this yes compassion I and in action is is very yeah. important because otherwise it's uh, it's an escapism into a fantasy about compassion yeah that this is that this is that and i would like to uh, ask uh, tom uh, mark beckley excuse me uh, for a short uh, advosum to to uh, speech of david uh, if you see possible uh, this from the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals experience, your experience working with this. Mark, you are invited. Absolutely. I, I, I really love what David said, and I, I agree. There are a few things that are really interesting because never before in human history have we ever went from one age or epoch or had a transformation without some form of technology, the pneumatic tire, the steam engine, the printing press, the computer, um, and it's interesting that we're at that same pivotal moment in time that now we've got AI, we've got emerging technologies that really are on the cusp of helping humanity to make it into a new age or epoch. I, I deeply believe we need to leave the Anthropocene and get into a new age or epoch. The problem is, is we're, we're fallible. We're, we're not... Um, concise, we're not in agreement with one another, and we need some kind of innovation or system out there that helps us guide in the right direction with that compassion, with that ethics, to give us the support and the knowledge and the training um, of cumulative human wisdom so we don't make the main, same mistakes or repeat the same things over and over again. AI. Uh, has many examples of how that can integrate with the sustainable development goals. This first time in human history, it's the first ever global moonshot, the first ever earth shot, where 197 countries came together for the first time ever and agreed on plans, actions, a roadmap for the future, a people plan, a protection plan, an insurance plan for humanity. The big issue is there's a lot of debate and controversy because there's no collective intelligence, no AI to accumulate all that knowledge and show us the innovative way to go forward and kind of be the mediator between us all. Uh, at the beginning of what David said as well, we, we talked about sentience, he talked about economics. Um, we, we need to make aware that um, it's not the debate of sentience, but our we having technology domesticate human beings or are we domesticating technology and are we willing to what are we as humanity willing to sacrifice for technology the the other big factor is by having this this help and this guide that it, that has compassion has ethics and is innovative that can can really give us that edge exponentially to move in in the future so that we're holding to to the goals, the targets, the indicators, the monies, the transformation. And that's where what David said about economics, most people don't know that the sustainable development goals are an entirely new ecological economic model. 90 trillion US dollars by December 2030 to reach the sustainable development goals. If you don't think that 90 trillion US dollars is, is an economic model, uh, I don't know what is. And, and in the Netherlands, the tulip economy is a lot less than 90 trillion and it's considered its own economic model. 
This is a new ecological economic model that is a plan and a way forward for humanity that I think businesses can use. And David touched upon it so eloquently, and I, I'm really in full agreement that as, as we do that, we do it in the right way, we can make some huge achievements and, and really achieve the goals in a short possible time. And the economic model is already there. Thank you, Mark, very much for that intervention. Um, it, that probably is the best moment when I could invite the Tom Eddington for uh, the f eight minutes uh, speech. If the big, big, big business is able to share assets to empower the sustainable development goals, um, even ac being actualized um, by well-being, human dignity perspective, ethical perspective. What do you think, uh, Tom? Oh, sorry, we don't hear you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, talking about business and uh, business opportunities, um, just a, a little bit of background first. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that when we're talking about AI, we're at a Promethean moment when Prometheus, the god of fire, brought fire to, to humanity. That's where we are as a species with regard to AI. We, we have this um, carbon, um, silicon, um, relationship and, uh, that's being generated, being formed. Businesses are trying to make sense of it. Uh, we don't have defined business models yet. There's billions of dollars being spent on AI. Um, each of the businesses that have spent those kinds of money, I mean, Amazon most recently, their $4 billion uh, acquisition, um, they're all trying to figure out how are they gonna make money with AI? And they're looking through the lens of commercialization. They're looking through the lens of making money. And they're not looking through the lens of some of the other uh, points that have been already raised by David and others, Mark. Um, and that's, uh, unfortunately, that's where we will find ourselves is similar to what's happened with, cl with uh, climate change. If we go back to 1971, the Secretary General of the United Nations said, without, uh, with, with all of the geniuses and with all of their skills, uh, they uh, ran out of foresight and air and food and water and ideas. Uh, Antonio Guterres in 2021, once again, was talking about climate change and the hubris of a business, the hubris of our, our leaders are um, looking at AI solely through the lens of commercialization, solely through the lens of market share and bringing uh, common business practices to a new technology, a new way of doing business, seeing huge market opportunities without really looking at um, the, the potential impact on humanity. We've got um, August 22nd of this year was the World Overshoot Day when we use more resources on the planet uh, for the year than what uh, resources are available. And AI has the potential to help us solve that. It has the potential to help us accelerate that and create even more of a problem. So if, if there's not um, something um, that helps guide businesses in their decision-making process that helps inform the creation of their business models, like an AI charter, similar to the Earth Charter that was created in the 1990s, we, we run the risk of, uh, of the extermination of, of the human species. And so um, looking at, um, at creating not only regulation and policy, but incorporating compassion, uh, looking at decentralization versus centralization, as we've, we've seen with power generation, and uh, really looking at uh, processes and methodologies to match the problem. So uh, using a public health model or virology model or war games model, internet cybersecurity model, scenario planning models to, to really understand and define 
the potential risk of AI um, and how and who should be overseeing and uh, having impact on, uh, on the thinking behind it. And I, I look at uh, someone like uh, Nicholas Robinson at Pace University, who has said a generative AI is emerging faster than we can cope. So we need not try to outrun the machine, but regain mastery of ourselves and our ethics and create the self-discipline to manage the uses of AI. And bringing that kind of vocabulary, that kind of mindset, that kind of thinking into, uh, into industry, into the development of the business models are essential if, uh, if AI can bring and deliver the promises that we all hope for um, without the risk. Thank you, Tom. Very interesting <coughs> what you tried to say. And uh, I see that the business, even being not prepared till today, um, organize themselves to, to be prepared to share assets. And this is great what you can observe and uh, from your intervention. Uh, Mark uh, Grobelnik is with us and I would like to uh, invite you to short two minutes uh, at Volsum to the Tom Ellington. H how uh, the organization, international organization uh, in which uh, you are engaged um, is preparing for that kind of um, maybe the gaps and asymmetry uh, what Tom tried to uh, set. Yeah, <coughs> Robert, thanks. Uh, so Tom nicely referred uh, to the whole thing as this Prometheus uh, moment. Yeah, uh, it's true, right? I mean, uh, we can see this um, on a scientific side, right? And as well as on the commercial side uh by all the indicators um, uh, and um, now one uh, aspect which is kind of relevant uh, so it's true on one side we have all these international organizations which robert you listed before right this includes oecd council of europe uh, uh including nato unesco and and a few more uh which are trying to regulate right um, uh, this AI. Uh, most of this regulation actually started uh, in like uh, 2018, 19, right? Uh, so definitely years before the so-called ChatGPT moment. So this is this Prometheus uh, moment which Tom mentioned, right? And uh, so back then AI was uh, uh, kind of slow uh we were regulating or discussing ai which was happening um within that year so certainly ai which was happening either after year 2000 or af after 2010 uh, uh which didn't have that huge tempo as uh, as now right and then it, what it happened so in late 22 uh this chat gpt moment happened and all the regulators basically got confused this includes especially the regulators we uh, which had a plan to uh, to bring legally binding uh, legally binding uh, uh, documents so this would be council of europe and eu right and uh, it was unclear what to do right because uh, the principle of work was uh, different right and now what's happening uh, during 2023 uh, is that somehow all these organizations are trying to adapt. Yeah? Uh, what we see, uh, uh, there are basically two, two major principles, right? So one is this a little bit slower democratic way of preparing the uh, regulation, right? Um, and this is what most of these organizations are doing. On the other hand, there's one... Uh, more like innovative approach on how to establish this balance between the power of AI and some kind of public trust and how to prevent, possibly prevent dangers. This is what uh, US and Canada uh, did just recently. So Canada just maybe uh, two weeks ago, uh, US maybe months or months and a half ago, right? So this is this voluntarily conduct between uh, companies, big tech companies, selected big tech companies uh and the government right uh so this is something which is kind of established or kind of uh established trust by by a handshake right uh, uh which is also kind of interesting uh 
Uh, and so th this is what uh, how I see development of the whole thing in this last uh, last year in particular, right? Uh, and just the last statement, right? So so this year I visited many events. So unfortunately I couldn't be uh, physically in Japan, but uh, I was basically traveling for the last three months on all sorts of AI events. So uh, what Tom was saying about uh, companies trying to uh, uh, running for well commercial commercial values or uh, land grab as uh, the market uh, market grab right i would say this is mostly true yeah this is mostly true and there are at least two levels right at least two levels of this competition one is <clears throat> between companies themselves right so uh, at least on the western side we have three four companies which are fighting for uh, this major uh, stake so this includes Microsoft, uh, AWS, uh, so Amazon, Google, and Meta to some degree, right? Uh, although running mostly on, on AWS, right? Uh, so this is between a company. This is kind of market competition. On on the second level, you have geopolitical uh, 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 competition, competition, which is mostly goes between US, Europe, and uh, China. Right? China is coming and China is good, right? Uh, they have all the brain you can imagine. They, they just lack the hardware, right? So, but it's likely will get compensated as well. So, uh, okay, not to be too long, right? Because this is just the Two minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, comment, but uh, these are a couple of, couple of thoughts yeah. on Tom Tom's. Uh, Thank you, Mark. Uh, no. That was good comments. Uh, you make a very um, big essence uh, of, of four years wor of working in uh, an international organization, and, and uh, you actualize you actualize our new um, considerations. Now you're looking for the, uh, how to cover the gaps, how to deal with the uh, challenges. Eddie, if we are so far, you. Is it still missing with you? Yes, I I, like I, yes, it's, I will just short because I know that we are miss, missing time. Uh, first, uh, this is what we try to do in Global Artificial Intelligence uh, Alliance. We try to find the right question. We didn't looking for the answer because I think this is the question are moving us. The question are changing the reality. And this was the, the one of the question which you asked me. I think we need a good question. We start. We should start with thinking and asking ourselves what we don't know, what we don't understand. F second things, uh, uh, I think again, uh, I will come back to, to this. I, I think that we forget that the rules and regulations, not everything, that uh, what the Kant said, the starry sky above me, the moral law between me. This is what we should have. We should start it from ourselves. If you are thinking about creating AI, about creating any kind of the technology which can destroy that to help us, we start to think about ourselves and ask you who we are, what we are doing, what is the most important for us, what kind of ethics, what kind of the world we would like to create in the future. And I think this is the thing. We don't know really what kind of the world we want to create. I think we are still busy with the, with the time which is now and we are not asking ourselves how the future should look like because we don't know. We didn't have the imagination. We didn't have enough imagination. We need a good question. We need to remember that everything started from ourselves, not from technology, not from law, from not from uh, uh, something which is outside of us. You said that you would like to additionally ask the Mark for yes, some yes, story. Yes, 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 because I, I know Mark, we have this amazing conversation with you when you spent few years asking the people about the future. And if you can just, I will give you my time if you can just in Mark, two, three we minutes. We change structure, but only one minute, yes, please. <laughs> you remember the question which you asked the people about how they see the future. I love what you said. Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just showing my screen now, and uh, hopefully you can you can see it because I yeah, want to tell it. you about that real quick. So um, I asked this question, and it's an old question. We've been asking it for over 70 years. It's what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And it's a big, huge social experiment uh, that I've conducted. I've asked 3,500 people on video this question. Um, this question was on, on podcasts, on videos, at events. Uh, most of the people I've asked are authors. And some interesting th things happen. When I ask them the question, what does a world that works for everyone look like for them? 
Mark, excuse me. Each and we, every, we, excuse yes? me. We have uh, some technical problem with your presentation. Uh, we have uh, like a ping pong coming and disappearing. Stroboscope uh, issue. I, I don't know if it's specially prepared because it, it could be like an advertisement in the movie, <laughs> but probably not. Oh, maybe. I can I can uh, do it again. Just one second. Sorry about the technical. Okay, maybe you... Okay, hold on, here it is. Yeah, yeah, hold on. So that may be... Uh, we, we come back with your turn, next turn to this. But David, uh, okay, well now we see it. Okay, we'll come back to you, Mark, please. Now we have a problem with voice. We miss you, Mark. Yeah, excuse me, and we come back to, to this uh, um, in some minutes, but in the prepared structure of our discussion, the next uh, intervener of Advocen to your speech was the David. David, only two minutes uh, to say uh, if, if, if Eddie Foundation, the Gaia Foundation uh, is prepared to do something. Yeah? Yes. So, <coughs> Global Artificial Intelligence Alliance, yeah. we um, founded this, co-founded it with, with, a, with a group, small group, but with the intention of making something truly global um, that would be d democratic for people, individuals to get involved, but also to incentivize corporations and governments and NGOs and many other uh, uh, people, anybody who has an interest in the future of life and how AI can help um, could get involved and benefit from, uh, from this. And so the, um, the idea of uh, big questions, of questing, of questing, questing yeah. um, is, uh, is very important. So having the right incentives for people to be involved becomes really imp important. Gamification is, um, is a principle that goes beyond games. Like um, uh, profit incentive for companies it can be real, but also for individuals where they have access. So there's a couple of uh, things. One is how do you create this kind of democracy of action? Um, and I think that a uh, you know the um, crowdsourcing of uh, of a, a market dynamics can really help, like voting in and you get something back, and people's information then becomes really valuable. And instead of just taking it and having them sign a license, like many companies do, just like give their data away, people should be able to have their voice heard and. Uh, participate by licensing in. So this kind of global um, data commons can be quite useful. A global AI commons can be incredibly powerful. There's this old story of the stone soup um, in, in the, uh, where, where there's no food. Everybody says there's no food, but one person says, I'm going to uh, um, feed the whole village with the stone. Um, but everybody else has to put in something as well. And you put in the stone, and then everybody, somebody brings carrots, somebody brings potatoes, somebody brings other ingredients, and pretty soon you have a big pot of s soup that feeds everybody. So if we do this with AI um, in a way that, um, that benefits the people who bring something to the table, we could see AI get um, smarter faster, but in a way that is truly inclusive and transparent, and that researchers in the world who don't have access, the people who don't have access to AI have access, but we have to include people from all over the world. Um, it really has to include the people in developing nations who don't have access to this technology. Um, it has to include leadership from the indigenous community. Um, it um, has to include the children of the world. And so we need what we, what we have come to call the guardians 
the Gaia guardians, the guardians of the world. We need people who step forward to be representatives in order to open the channels up for everybody else to have a voice. So um, then that idea of action the companies of the world actually right now are the ones that are out doing and getting stuff out there because um, because they have to. So da we have to. David. We just have to see that urgency. So thank you. Da David, thank you for that intervention. Uh, we, we need to fight with time, excuse me. The, the, uh, I will have a pleasure to, to listen to you longer <laughs> and uh, everybody here in the, the panel. Now I would like to ask the Marco Grubelnik Maybe for uh, understanding and uh, share some thoughts, is it technically and from the engineer point of view possible to define compassion approaches, principles to the system, artificial intelligence? How you see this, uh, Marco? You have uh, eight minutes yes. to, to take. To, to <laughs> I'll try to be shorter because I, I think I spent uh, some time before uh, more than was planned, but um, so the, the question is, uh, does the current technology yeah. allows us to approach this compassionate AI and all the terms which are, uh, or concepts which are lying uh, below, and this includes uh, um, uh, concepts like uh, empathy, uh, values, right? Uh, and and also there's uh, uh, how, to, how to construct and maintain a tissue, a uh, societal tissue, uh, between uh, between people or uh, actors in a uh, society, this, this would be basically living uh, being, right? So, short answer: Is it possible or no? Yes, I think uh, actually after this ChatGPT moment in this November 22, right, a uh, year ago, roughly 11 months ago, uh, uh, it's actually first time in the history of AI that we can even think about this, right? Uh, why? Because AI before was missing one extremely important element, and this was, uh, let's say, this text understanding. Text understanding, which with this ChatGPT or large language models, we are kind of approaching. We really don't understand the text yet, right? Uh, but we we can mimic text understanding to that degree that it's good enough, right? So this this is the current status, right? Uh, so these LLMs are literally just, just uh, in a way, reflecting what we are putting in. So we put in the whole web, right? And these LLMs are reflecting what, uh, what we put in. But since this is so much of information, um, uh, we get a feeling that actually these machines are smart. And they actually, it is pretty impressive moment in, in the development of AI that we can do something like this, right? Uh, what else, uh, as an ingredient of this current AI technology, is there? So it's not just reflecting, so retrieval of what we put in, but there, there are kind of limited uh, capabilities of um, inferencing or reasoning as well, right? It's not perfect, but there exists this uh, 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 elements of <clears throat> deductive reasoning, a little bit less on induction, right? Which uh, uh, well, which machine learning is covering by on a separate track. Um, machines are extremely good on abductive reasoning, right? And and also uh, amazingly good on parts of uh, causal reasoning, right? So why I'm saying this? So these are kind of ingredients uh, on the top of which we 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 can then develop uh, this compassionate AI as a as a, a functional functional uh, system, right? Now, from the other side, right? So what is AI, right? AI is kind of this nice term which we use now for, I don't know, 70, 80 years, right? Uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, we can say that AI is, uh, is a, uh, an area or science of complexity. We have also separate also this complexity science, which mostly physicists are working on, right? But also AI by itself is dealing with complexity. As, as, as it was said before, right? So um, I think David said before, right? Uh, uh, that um, uh, AI is looking for these complex patterns in um, basically data which are coming mostly in an organic way from the society. So, uh, so the AI basically is solving fairly uh, complex uh, problem. Now, 
can it uh, do something like compassion? Yes, I think, right? So if we, uh, I will use now a fairly mathematical way of expressing, if we, if we want to uh, develop an operator, right? Mathematical operator, which we, we would call uh, compassion, right? Compassion and which would consist from uh, empathy, uh, uh, positive human values or liberties, as uh, it was said before, and uh, um, holding the societal tissue in a kind of positive way. Yes, then we can approach, I would say, uh, with these ingredients, as I said before, so reflecting the human uh, knowledge and data on one side uh, with some limited capabilities of reasoning. Yes, these are ingredients where we can approach. Now, how this could be implemented, we could easily implement this as an additional like layer on the top of the existing, not just AI, but also IT system, uh, which could, let's say, try to understand and try to guide or steer uh, the decisions of uh, IT or uh, uh, AI system. So the, this is something which uh, it's, I think it's implementable uh, at this stage. Can companies do this? Can companies actually are doing a little bit of this? I mean, even if in, let's say in the last uh, one year, if you remember the first version of ChatGPT, how it was in November last year, and the version, uh, how it uh, responds today, it changed a lot, right? Uh, so it doesn't allow certain negative um, uh, queries and, and so on. But they achieve this not by any kind of, uh, let's say, higher level, uh, higher level uh, philosophical uh, approach, but by a fairly simple red teaming. Uh, this is the term, right? Yeah. Where you have an army of people which are kind of just uh, 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 killing the, the bad uh, questions. So uh, I would imagine that compassion to the AI would be something more, uh, which would have a little bit more philosophical and societal uh, values built in by itself and the system which would be fairly generic on the top of this. Thank you. Now, not to be too long, I will stop yeah, here. Yeah. I could talk way more. <laughs> thank you very much. We have a limited time, but uh, thank you very much, Marco, for a very short intervention. Uh, I have a, a bit changed my s structure of that uh, whole, uh, trying to keep the time for, for some audience. And now I would like to invite the, uh, Mark Buckley uh, come back uh, to say uh, something uh, how it will be, um, how we can impact from that perspective on compassion the SDG agenda. If you are still with us, it's okay, but we uh, have a limited time, uh, only five minutes to keep last five minutes for audience. Thank you. We don't hear you. Can you see my screen? Oh, yes, now yes. Okay, and you can hear me great. So, we don't hear you, but we see your screen. United Nations has, a, has some problems with connection. <laughs> or not, only some country, United States. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark, excuse me, we have a limited time and uh, let's give the uh, floor for our audience in the room or in, in, the, in online. Uh, if somebody has some questions or some comments, uh, you are invited, we have limited time, excuse me, this is the last 11 minutes, maybe Mark came back. Please, Mr. Michał is from, you are from Poland. Thank you, thank you. Uh, can you hear me through the mic? Yes. Okay, um, thank you very much. I represent a, a government, but it really doesn't matter. We are in Chatham House rules right now. And uh, I was, I really like the way we throw ourselves into a philosophical discussion because AI development uh, takes, uh, uh, a philosophical discussion to to go on to to be, to to still be open, and uh, for me the topic is is so complex that I had to uh, take some uh, some 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 notes in order not to get lost in what I'm trying to say. So if I you know uh, 
thank you very much. That this is uh, uh, this is a this is a very interesting uh, point about compassion and. Uh, the way I see this is if you just have a spectrum, you know, and you put compassion on a spectrum, then there must be, uh, there must be limit uh, to what is still compassionate for an eye to do and what is no longer com compassionate, right? And uh, so uh, what is compassionate? And uh, the most intuitive answer would be uh, whatever has us developing is 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 compassionate and uh, this is i guess this is not the uh, the right answer because a better one would be uh, developing but and still making us more more human right mm -hmm. that that might be more compassionate right than than just to uh, have us something that has us uh, developing all the time because there has to be a limit to what is uh, to what is achievable you know and I, I and i have a question i was desperate to ask you uh, this question <laughs> you don't have to answer the question right now uh, i uh, very much like what you said about your definition of, of compassion and uh, whatever, I mean, the appreciation of life, right? And my, uh, my question to per perhaps have you talking about what's compassionate, uh, what is compassionate and, uh, and what is not compassionate, you know, I mean, uh, would you deploy AI to mass the genetics of a sheep, for example, in order to cure human cancer, would that would that still be com 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 compassionate? I mean, it works for the humans, right? It doesn't work for sheep, right? And it has us uh, developing in a humanly m m manner. And uh, that would, you know, your your. Uh, I'd like to pick up your brain on this because that would tell me. A little bit more about what do you think is compassionate, right? And where is the limit of compassionate? Are we the ultimate? Our development I, is it the ultimate goal of of this AI uh, compassionate-based concept? Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Michael, for your intervention. Maybe before I, uh, David, you, you, you jump. First of all, I think we need to deal more and more with our human compassion state. We, our le uh, level of this is, could be under question now. And uh, I thank you for that ship uh, comparison, uh, working in OECD, producing the, some values uh, for our, uh, artificial intelligence and principles. Finally, we got it, what, what I tried to underline on the beginning, that animal is it's important. We have a conjunction between the human and planet. This is a principle. And now, that was a, in, in that time, what that was very uh, deep conversation. What, what is first in the hierarchy? Human. Just now, artificial intelligence on something between David. Please intervene, if you can take it. Sure. I mean, I think um, a lot of ethical systems that we have are laws or regulations, and this includes things like um, uh, regulations that are protecting right. animal rights for research purposes. Um, and how you have to do these ethical review boards uh, to be able to do science with the animals. Um, uh, effectively, what that is, is an attempt to um, weigh the, um, the cost and benefits um, and then represent the ethical conundrums that occur. So it's a kind of, it's, it's, it's very much like what uh, Marco was ta talking about. Um, uh, uh, about uh, the a kind of um, almost a Boolean logic of compassion. Like um, you run through a calculation, is it worth it? Well, I mean, sometimes if you're smarter, you don't have to sacrifice ethics in one situation or create suffering in, say, a sheep animal model in order to achieve some medical breakthrough. Maybe you can do that um, in silico instead in in a simulation and be able to achieve the same thing but right now we, we're not smart enough um, to be able to, to do that but we might also not be smart enough to be able to be as compassionate as we could so can we use these technologies the silico to enhance human compassion to be able to run these kinds of calculations maybe we can maybe um, maybe it's a worthy uh, quest. 
We have a so just yeah, may I add something questions. because just one, one thing because if we believe that. Uh, AI can create super AI and super super AI and super super AI. Maybe super, uh, maybe artificial intelligence c can create super compassion and super super compassion because and super we, human and su uh, super human too. But for <laughs> sure, <laughs> but sure can push us forward to understanding. Not about only hum when we start to understand better human nature, we start to understand better compassion. And I deeply believe that we can use AI to create super compassion. Then the answer will be yeah, completely point. different than the answer we have now. This is why I'm talking about the questions. Thank, thank you, Eddie, for ta no, taking. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we have so two two people would like to take so even four. Like we have uh, only five minutes. Please, a short question, a short answer. Uh, Christian, we welcome you. That you with us. Thank Please. you, uh, Christian Remsel from the OECD. Um, I have a very brief question. Um, is it fair to say that at this current stage of AI, where I see at least AI being more close to software than being to a human being, um, that the level of compassion is essentially dictated and kept by the level of compassion of humans? And is it fair to even say that it's probably kept by the level of compassion of those that have the capacity to develop that, which are currently those with the with the financial resources. Yeah, thank this you is for the uh, question. Yes, uh, Ma Marco, I would like to ask uh, people yeah. from online. Please take uh, it. The very quick uh, answer. Uh, uh, yeah, at the moment, uh, the whole thing is in the hands of the big tech. Uh, from uh, this is maybe uh, five. Uh, certainly less than 10 spots in the world which can do something like this uh, so uh, and uh, but uh, there is a good prospect that things may change in the future so just to keep the answer uh, uh, short uh, I'm not pessimist I think uh, things are going in a good direction uh, it's just uh, the, the things so basically what we are witnessing now in the last year are something which I, I never expected I will witness in my life right so and this is the same uh, for most of my colleague scientists right so uh, and we are all uh, still watching what's happening right? thank you but Mar the answer is Marco yes. I, I can confirm this because we very often work together <laughs> that is possible and we can develop our existence uh, uh, outputs to, to new uh, compassion even approaches yes. last uh, yeah we have uh, only four minutes uh, I need one minute so for my intervention uh, very quick questions very quick questions very quick questions uh, I don't know uh, who would like to take it sure I will have a very quick question to uh, three David. minutes um, for, uh, for all of us. My name is Katarzyna Stociwa. I represent the National Research Institute in Poland, and my area of expertise is preventing and combating child sexual exploitation and abuse. So my question refers to what you have said, and that you would like to include people from all over the world to have their say. Then uh, how would you uh, secure voices of children in this process? especially knowing that uh, generative AI can also pro can now produce uh, child sexual abuse materials. So uh, real children can be victimized by using their artificial artificially generated uh, photos or videos uh, for these purposes. So uh, how to make voices of ch children included in the process of creating compassion uh, within the AI. You asked the question for somebody spe specifically okay. or to... Uh, to David, because to David, yes. he was uh, yeah. talking about it. Uh, Thank David, you. only 15 uh, seconds. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> excellent this is question. My compassion. And, and I think the, the key is having strong guardians. So we have to um, find uh, people who have proven themselves to be really uh, doing good work for the world and it has to be inclusive it can't just be like um, from one um, uh, subgroup of of humanity and we have to name the values that we're aiming for um, and so those um, those values that harm life that harm children that lead to this kind of destruction are not welcome in the future they shouldn't be welcome. We need guardians who take that stand, who guard our children, and then also give those children a voice as well, so they can participate. Because yeah, often we don't hear. There are no children yeah. in this in this room, and I think uh, that that the children have uh, like uh, 
uh, almost, um, I mean, uh, preternatural insights seconds. into the Thank world. You. So, so we, so through mechanisms like uh, what we call the guardians, um, we can create a more inclusive democracy. Thank you, David. Fifteen seconds left. Last very short question, please. You present yourself, and uh, we have. Yeah, yeah. Probably Thank you. My we name have a is one. Yeah, my name is Shizuka Morika, and I'm, I'm just thrilled to hear what you all have to say. And in terms of uh, wh what I feel missing is provide uh, right incentives to for-profit corporations, especially in the U.S. And we just, you know, perform to the expectations and for the rewards. And I've been wondering how can we get rid of the quarterly earning you know regulations because european countries they have done it many of them right but i'm i've been wondering how can we get the u.s to stop quarterly earning requirements uh, u.s if i could understand started uh, to that process yes uh, <laughs> maybe it's not so proper that's a different approach or responsible AI, more than trustworthy this is this is that of course, because that discussion today appeared, yes. Last question, Mr. Takashida from Japan, and last intervention, uh, anyone so who would thank like you to for uh, inviting me, Robert, and, and thank you all for your inspiring talks. I don't have a question, but I actually have a last statement to make. <laughs> Number one, AI as a term is quite outdated. Artificial intelligence, what does that mean? I think that reflects the relationship of man-machine man relationship as master and slave. As long as humans do you know, engage machine or AI in that way, you have the risk and the fear. But we, now we have to redefine what true intelligence is. And in my opinion, that's compassion. And David uh, mentioned about sentient, possibility of sentient uh, machines. So that's totally possible on the ground that we elevate our consciousness with compassion. And we have some invention on the way, as Ray Kurzweil mentioned in the spiritual machine. So I'm totally optimistic for the future of Compassion AI. Thank you. Well, thank you for your good comments from the Japan culture and uh, your experience of life. Thank, thank you for that. I would like to ask our online colleagues, especially maybe Mark and Tom, if you could comment very shortly, on only 15 seconds because we don't have time, even if we pass the time. If you have, would like to have last intervention, please, you are welcome. If not, yeah, I'll just I'll go ahead and uh, just uh, ah. share one uh, one closing comment. Uh, from my perspective, we have to be intentional and architect compassion into the development of whether we call it artificial intelligence, silicon intelligence, whatever we call it. Uh, we have to be intentional about uh, architecting compassion into it. If we don't, uh, it will it will evolve into whatever it's going to evolve into. And uh, we can't allow that to happen. Um, and we're, we're running out of time to be that, to bring that intentionality to do the work. Thank you, Tom, very much. Mark, your last chance, only 30 uh, seconds. I, <clears throat> I think uh, artificial intelligence has uh, probably occurred because we're called homo sapiens, the wise man. So we, we think we're wise and have, have a lot figured out. And so now as we create our, our new children, uh, artificial intelligence, and we give them um, compassion and ethics and the guidance, which, which we're hoping to do with Gaia and, and this group here today, I think uh, we can have it live up to that name that when us as the, the fathers or the creators of AI ask it to do something that is, goes against life or humanity, that our children, uh, artificial intelligence, come back and say to us, 
uh, no, we're, we're not going to destroy or hurt those other human beings. Instead, we're just going to talk to the other AIs on the other end or the other culture and, and work it out um, like uh, decent beings or intelligent beings would instead of dividing uh, ourselves amongst one another. And so I, I really have high hopes that we can build those ethics and that compassion into to AI and that we can use it as strong tools um, to help us get on the right side of history, that we use this technology to really get out of the Anthropocene into the Symbiocene, into a new age of homo symbiose and all, sen all sentient and all life beings on Earth. Yeah, thank you, Mark. This is time to make some conclusions. Um, well, for me, I was super happy that you can share your thoughts, your considerations, and, and interacting uh, um, with uh, our panelists. I'm super happy about uh, the question uh, where come to our discussion. Even very serious questions, um, but uh, need to be addressed. And uh, what I would like to propose uh, as a call to action that are two uh, approaches. Think, uh, the first thing could be let's uh, have impact uh, on this way uh, to prioritize the UNESCO ethical recommendation over the SDG agenda and in the same moment and define, redefine the SDG agenda uh, to enrich uh, uh, it by um, technology and especially ethically, uh, ethical approach, ethical usage, uh, ethical deployment of the technology. That will be one, one thing. And second thing, trying to uh, find a common understanding of compassion, especially I underline compassion, not how so much compassion, and that compassion is the next step after the empathy approach to, co to, to compassionate. Compassion as a verb, as an activity, as a noun, as an understanding, as a knowledge, deep flying, uh, swimming in that, in, in that uh, substance and, and future uh, appreciation of other people. Uh, I would like to uh, propose the call to produce AI compassion bridge charter. Why bridge? But we have some papers. We have some resolutions, some recommendation, but we get from today's town hall that we have uh, some gaps. And uh, I invite many people and uh, international organizations, um, our uh, audience, participants, to um, produce that kind of AI compassion bridge charter and uh, engaging uh, network uh, for compassion approach to artificial intelligence. That, uh, we, I get it as a two, uh, call for action for next year, not more. That will be, that we need to do, act very quickly. And I welcome very much uh, next summit of, of compassion. Uh, that will be, the location will be announced, uh, but um, uh, I would like to find uh, the, the buyer, uh, 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 bigger network of uh, AI guardians developed part uh, of that uh, AI charter. And uh, Eddie, if you would like to uh, have a closer remarks. Uh, I just would like to, okay. I, I just want to invite you to this, to Salzburg in March, 6, 8 March for AI Impact Summit. We need all people who want to, to help. We need all organizations who want to have the impact, who understand that with AI we can really have the impact for the world. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. And see you uh, in the future compassion. <laughs> <laughs>